You are listening to the People Centric Podcast, where we talk through the toughest challenges that people face at work and give practical advice to fixing those challenges. Thanks for joining our movement to create workplaces that are happier, healthier, aligned, and empowered by putting people at the center of all that we do. Hey, people-centric leaders, people-centric. I've got one job. Hey, 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 people. It even almost count downs for it. It almost counts, counts, counts you down. And that was your brain. That's what your brain. You're the one that hit record. It wasn't even a surprise that the recording was going to happen. Isn't it funny how our minds work like that? We've been down in Tennessee this week. So I just (laughs) was going to say that no offense to our (laughs) friends in Tennessee. We love, we love it, but we are a little Southern right now. (laughs) So, hey, people, centric leaders, this is what we're going to do here. Oh, welcome to the podcast, Matt Griswold and Don Harkey here are just jumping right in. We're just yeah. jumping into the humor and the imperfection, which is people centric because it's very people centered to be imperfect. Yeah, so that was, that's the last one we wanted to put out there. Yeah, I love it. Hello. Hello, everybody. Good to be back home on the road. We're in the midst of this travel season right now from from conference to conference. I tell everybody I'm going to be like that Snickers commercial. I don't know. It's like a (laughs) faux rock band like, thank you, Detroit. And then his, you know, the guitarist leans over. They're like, you're in Dallas. And he's like, oh, right. You're cool, too. Right. Thank you, Dallas. And that's what it feels like last week from Tennessee. And this week we uh, Don's going to ride with the family. Sometimes I like to bring the family to these things. And Don's going to hop in with the family tomorrow. We're going to head to Wichita, Kansas, and then on to Des Moines next week, Don, and then Chicago, Illinois, and then Breckenridge, Colorado. Like it's uh, it's nuts. And that's all by the first week of May. We're taking this on the road and, you know, just throwing this out to folks there who you listen to the podcast. If you ever think, geez, do they ever do this in person in terms of a podcast? We do. It's not just the podcast episodes, but the training, the workshops. That's why I like to bring this stuff to you because this is not our full-time job. Turns out doing this podcast, we actually have a consulting firm and we actually work with organizations and we help them to implement the things we talk about. That's why our stories are so fresh. It'd be kind of fun. It'd be kind of, I just thought of this, but sometimes, you know, those podcasters do like a, they record a live session with the student, you know, with the, with the, with the audience there. And that might be a fun breakout. We we need to talk to somebody at one of these conferences. We're going to do live Q and a live Q and a anything on management leadership, but we're going to record it as a podcast. Whoever wants to be involved in that. Doesn't that sound fun? That does sound kind of fun. I just imagined this, you know, three, two, one. Hello, people. Oh no. (laughs) Hey, people. Live. Oh, we messed this up. (laughs) Yeah, well, we kind of yeah. do it live anyway. We don't do a lot of editing because we feel like you like the banter. We like, mm-hmm. feel like you like the witty banter between our team. So so you've got Matt Griswold and Don Harkey today. The rest of our team is out on assignment. Everybody's out and about doing stuff, which is great. Uh, but Matt and I have been giving a new keynote presentation. We're just starting to put this out there. And it's this message. And we're going to bring this out to you today and kind of give you a little bit of a, of a preview of it. Uh, and the idea is what we're calling it is the perfect storm. Uh, how millennials are going to change, save the world. That's the, that's the, that's the pitch of this. It's the perfect storm. You just hear click, click, click. A lot of all, everybody's turning this <laughs> off right now. Click. That's <laughs> false, right? Because there might be a false narrative there. There are the, the, the stories that we've already told ourselves about this millennial population. And Don, I think the first time we're going to roll this out, I think it's going to be with our friends in Florida at the Florida HLA conference in June. They have requested. So if you're headed to Florida for the HLA conference, you want to be in your seat for this one. It is the perfect storm, something that we're all we're all dealing with right now, although you might just think it hurts. There's a reason it hurts. It's this perfect storm, right? It's this perfect storm. The good news about everybody, if you're listening to this and you got frustrated because I just hear how you heard the how millennials are going to save the world and you're trying to click this off, you're probably a boomer and you're probably struggling to shut this off right now. <laughs> So that's the fun part is that you're probably you're probably still listening to us even now. So maybe maybe you should stick around longer because let's talk about yeah. what we're thinking about. So let's let's first of all let's introduce what this perfect storm is, and then it's going to give you an opportunity to think a little bit about how that impacts you, how that impacts your organization, whether you're a boomer, whether you're a millennial, whether you're Gen Z, Gen X, all those different things. Uh, here's what the perfect storm is: the perfect storm is a confluence of two 
factors and they're demographic factors. So these aren't like trends. We're not like telling you like high tops are coming back or anything like that. What we're telling you is these are two demographic trends that are literally by the number of people that are born in different generations. And the first one is that boomers are retiring. And boomers are retiring at a rate that is faster than what we actually expected originally. And the problem is with is that the Gen Xers, there's not as many of them. So there's not enough of Gen X, which is my generation. Yours too, Matt, right? We're both Gen X, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Nobody just talks about done. us. We just do stuff. That's what we talk about. We just get stuff done. No one ever does a presentation on the pain of Gen X. We're just doing mm. stuff. Not since the Newswick Bart Simpson uh, cover. <laughs> Should be the the blessing of Gen X. If you, you know what I mean, like That's you're right. welcome, everybody. We're here, but we don't need kudos. We're just going to keep running things <laughs> while these other generations work stuff out. But there's not enough of us to take over all those boomer positions. So as the boomers are retiring and they're leaving, and they're taking a lot of knowledge and experience with them, uh, partially because they know so much and they learn so much, partially because sorry, boomers, you're not very good at get passing information on to others as a generation. That might be not true for some individuals of you. We're grossly stereotyping here, but. Uh, now, as you leave, a lot of you are going to be replaced by millennials. Uh, so you're going to have some folks that are going to come in that are going to be very, very different. So if you think about this, I've read some studies that show like the average B2B buyer by 2025 will be a millennial, whereas in the past five years, they've been a boomer. So if you think about all of the things that impact you on that, like, the, and we'll get into that a little bit here in a second, but if you think about like just who you're selling to, your customer was boomers if you're a B2B company and now it's going to be millennials. Uh, think about like if you're a healthcare practice, uh, think about the doctors that are going to retire and what they can do. Think about the people who are experts at billing and what they do and they're going to retire and you're going to replace them with people with 20 years less experience than the person that you have. That's that's just the first factor. That sounds, if that's not, that doesn't scare you enough. It's funny, we did this at a presentation <laughs> recently and I said, they're going to be replaced by millennials. And the room went, oh no. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, oh, that's no. true. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too. So we'll give millennials to give you a chance to defend yourselves here. And you know, and Don, that, that first part too, I don't want to step on your toes. I know you're going to do the next part of what that perfect storm looks like. Uh, we don't say that to say that the millennials are not capable. Uh, it's not, it's not a capability or, a, a, a even a want to, uh, a mentality. It's, it's, it's the, the amount of knowledge and the experience that maybe the, you know, that, that, like you said it at a conference we were at a couple weeks ago, that's 20 years worth of less experience now rolled into that manager managerial role or that leadership role. And so it's not a capability. It's not a want to, we're not sliding on that. It's just literally the amount of years. And how often do you learn everything for your job in a book? Uh, right or in a training um you don't it's the experience over time that you're just like oh i was burned by that once or twice i know that it's uh, i should do that but i know from experience i'm not going to do that i'm going to go this way um you know so it's, it's really the experience that we're missing yeah and we're actually really big fans of millennials and gen z's uh we see them working very hard they work differently than boomers do but i think sometimes the definition of hard work is different for a boomer than it is for a millennial and i think both sides would agree to that but I think that uh, in terms of productivity, a lot of research shows that millennials are extremely productive as a generation. But you're right. It's the knowledge. It's the experience that they are walking out with, which is significant. That's a big shift. Have mm -hmm. you learned a lot? And think of the last 20 years of your life. Have you learned anything? Uh, I hope the answer is, my gosh, yes, I've learned so many things. And so that stuff is just going to be walking out. Now, some organizations saw this coming. Some organizations have thought about this and we've worked with some of those. We've worked with companies, you know, 10, 15 years ago who saw this coming and said, I've got to think about the next generation coming up and I've got to get them ready to take over those positions. And they have some, maybe some Gen Xers who they've already positioned to take over that next spot or the, or the, even some millennials who they've been, they've been coaching and training and preparing uh, and getting ready for, but they haven't, uh, they haven't really, some, a lot of you have not been preparing. And so if you haven't been preparing and you don't have the next generation involved, you're probably not going to find a Gen Xer to take their spot. You're probably going to find a millennial and that's going to change a lot of things. Uh, the second, uh, the confluence, the second demographic factor that's going to cause the perfect storm, which goes from a storm to a perfect storm is the fact that we have a workforce shortage people. Uh, we've talked about this before. We did a whole episode on this is the great sandemic is upon us, right? We had the pandemic that influenced everybody, but now we have the sandemic, which was caused by the simple fact that we are not making enough babies in the United States. Uh, this is just a fact, uh, not on Matt's watch. Matt's doing his own thing. He's got five kids. He's, he's five not, part of, 
He's not part of the problem. He's part of the solution. Well, uh, I don't about the rest th- of you slouches, what you're doing, <laughs> what you're doing up there, all career minded and not whatnots. <laughs> I'm trying to save the world over here, but I, <laughs> we're done. I can't do anymore. If, if you're waiting for Matt's kids, it's going to take a minute for them to be ready, though. They're still in the oven cooking for a little bit here, and they'll come out here in the next 10, 15 years and right. be ready out there. He's got a couple of them that are out there, but he's got three more that's coming up. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll Do get them. We'll get them out there. Appreciate what you're doing for, for the world, Matt, and all the yeah. things that you do. Uh, but for the rest of us, like literally the two lines in economics that are not supposed to cross are the number of unemployed people and the number of jobs available. And traditionally, the number of unemployed people in most of our entire lifetimes has been higher than the number of jobs available. So if you have a job, if you're an employer and you need to go find somebody, well, there's some unemployed folks that are out there at least that you can find uh, to bring in. Well, now those two lines in 2018, not caused by the pandemic, nothing to do with the pandemic. This happened before the pandemic, 2018, those two lines crossed. And now there are more jobs available than there are people unemployed. So literally not enough people out there for the jobs. And it's not just good people, it's all people. So if you put those two things together, what you think about is this creates the perfect storm. You are going to be losing a lot of expertise and talent, and it's going to be not only hard for you to find somebody with the same level of expertise, but it's going to be hard for you to fill those jobs at all. And so we are seeing this happen across the board. We're seeing it happen in hospitals. You're seeing uh, them not be able to hire nurses and doctors in some places. We're seeing it happen in manufacturing where you're seeing a low uh, shortage of engineers, in places and operators, frontline workers, you're seeing it happen in restaurants. How many times have you been to a restaurant where you expected the restaurant to be open and you went and there's a sign on the door that said, hey, we were supposed to be open, but we were missing two servers called in. And so we just didn't open today and we're closed. Um, you're seeing the loss of expertise. You see panels flying off of the sides of airplanes. Uh, you keep hearing that from, we won't name the company. We'll just call it Boeing. Um, <laughs> We'll just call it Boeing just for fun. It's in the news. It's already out. News. You can see it. We didn't make that up. It's just out there. Uh, but you see this loss of general expertise that's hitting our market already. And those of us who haven't been preparing for it and aren't ready for it, you're going to have a big problem. You've got a big problem moving forward. So let's talk, Matt, a little bit about this challenge and what can we do about it? Is it just that we're it's over? Like just punt, or just wait for the next generation to come around and fix it up. Wait till your kids grow up. What's it look like, Matt? You know, that this is interesting. If you've heard us speak at all before, you've probably heard snippets of either side of this. The reason why this is the newest keynote is because we're combining this into one uh, with some new information there, too. But also because it's so darn relevant. Like you said, you painted a picture where it's it's everywhere. Uh, There's not an industry that uh, that escapes it. Although Don's uh, common theme is that there are organizations within India, any industry that we're dealing with that have kind of started to figure this out. Right. Uh, You know, we talked about succession plan and if you weren't if you know we were talking about succession plan 10 years ago or whatever and if you haven't if you didn't jump on the succession planning uh train at that time it has left the station now those people are in those moments and so their their succession planning is, is I, I you know they're already in the role and so now you immediately jump from this idea of succession planning to up training i think this is one of the things people are going to have to get on board with pretty quickly is how do i up train how do i how do i fast forward the process of getting this person ready to go and you know they they could read a book, they could listen to a, a podcast, whatever that might be, but they're probably going to need more support than that. And they're probably going to need more support than maybe the, even the the administration at, the, at, the, at that organization could potentially uh, provide. You know, on one hand, it feels like you're having to quote unquote babysit the new the new leader, but it's not their fault that they're in that role, right? They were the right place, right time. They have a lot of knowledge, uh, but but that experience is lacking. So they're, they're a willing vessel, but how do I now up train that person to be able to be as effective as we can be without losing something from the other side of that, uh, from the other side of that too. And then the, you know, the, the, you know, you're talking about the idea of the sans demic where the lack of people, again, we've talked about that from, from stage, we've talked about how we're all kind of competing for the same, the same people, you know, most of the people, and I would like to, if you're listening to this podcast, no matter where you are, were you unemployed and whenever you got this job that you're currently in, I would venture to say most people were not, right? They weren't. I think when we hear the sandstemic or the idea of the sandstemic, it's like, oh man, I only I can't hire anybody because I can only look at the unemployed population. And that's not true. And I don't think that's true for most of us. I, I was in a in a role where I could have stayed forever. I didn't have to, I didn't have to leave. I chose to leave. Don, I know you're in the same kind of situation. You didn't have to leave, you chose to leave. Most of the people listening to this right now. You're probably in that role, not because you were unemployed, you know, 
find trying just trying to find just trying to find something to do you were probably gainfully employed before so another opportunity kind of intriguing came along and you you reached out and captured it and that's the mindset that I think folks need to be in right now. I'm not worried about the unemployed numbers. I'm worried about those people who might not be satisfied because they're working for an, a subpar employer that is not, you know, either challenging them or giving them what it is that they feel like, uh, you know, the the level of value that they feel like they're bringing to the table. Um, how do I? How do I? How do I create an environment where I'm working to entice those people to want to, for lack of a better word, jump ship to come to what it is that we're trying to create over here. Um, and that's it. You know, we talk about us as create, we're trying to create a movement with this idea of people centric and slowly we're covering the country with these different, these different conferences. And we have the podcast and people are hearing the movement that we're trying to create of, you know, putting people at the center of every organization. And that's, that's, uh, that's our, you know, what we're, what we value as an organization, we're trying to create this idea. Um, and I think if I am an organization, that's one of the things that I need to be focused on right now, right now too. What are you trying to create? Why would people want to go there? And what would cause people to want to stay once they were there? Yeah. Yeah. I think about it almost. I, I tell the story about, I bought a car, you know, this year and it was the car was uh, you know, if you've been in the car market this year there, it's definitely a buyer's market or seller's market, excuse me. There's a, there's a, a low supply of cars out there. So the seller is in control. So it's a very different experience than it was five years ago when you went to buy a car. You know, five years ago, you went to buy a car, you walked to the dealership, all the salespeople kind of swarm all over you. They show you all the different cars, they take time with you, and then you can haggle and you can negotiate and you can do all the things. Now with the car market being the way it is, when you walk in and go buy a car, it's very, very different. They're not really looking for you. They don't need you. They've got other 10 other buyers, you know, ready to buy that car. Uh, you can't really haggle on the price because other people are already are already doing that. They can't really show you the car. They're not really interested in that. I mean, it's, just, it's very different. Same thing in the employee employment market. You know, five years ago, 10 years ago, we could get away with 20% unemployment. We could get away with 30% unemployment because we can go find somebody else. We'll go find somebody else. It's not a big deal. When you interviewed people, you would have multiple applicants for that job and those applicants would show up and they would try to get the job. They would be, they would be telling you what they thought you wanted to hear and trying to impress you on this. Now what we see is it's flipped and it's in the employees market now and they're showing up interviewing you find out what's it like to work for your company because I've got three other places I can go across the street. And some people are not responding well to that. Um, I, I'll tell you, my message to those people is get over it. You have, you're in a different market. Uh, and it's sometimes you're finding that it's hard to get applicants. So you have to be, become a better employer than other people. We, we use the bear analogy. I think we said that in the Sam's Demick, uh podcast episode, but a bear's wandered into the camp. A bear's going to eat somebody. Uh, what's the bears faster than all the other campers you're out there with the campers. What's your best strategy to get away from the bear It's not to outrun the bear it's to outrun the other campers. You have to become a better employer than the employers that's the one that are next to you, which means you have to do some things that are weird. And it's no longer enough just to do the, get the pay, right? It's no longer enough just to do benefits and do a 401k. You have to be a better work experience, which means you have to get those managers ready. So the perfect storm piece, we're going to go back to those managers, Matt, you talked about that aren't trained. What makes a person disengaged at work? What's the number one reason thing that makes a person disengaged at work? Oh, we don't we don't engage them. Yeah. Is that what you're going? Is that yeah. what you're going for? You just kind of set it in set it in reverse. I think a lot of times the reason why people are disengaged at work is because managers are not doing a good job of engaging them or bringing them to the table. Yeah, it's the managers that are. I mean, so like Gallup says that seventy percent of all disengagement is created by management. Yeah, And so now put those two things together. You have to be a great employee, employer. What makes a great employer? A lot of it is the manager. We don't leave jobs. We leave our managers. And then we also just said that because of the retirement, you're going to have this significant management shift, not just in frontline managers, but I mean, senior level managers. Uh, we just saw a stud study that showed that it's like 70% of CEOs in senior positions are admitting that they're not really ready for their jobs right now. Uh, we, we talked to a major retail company who is opening brand new stores frequently, and they're putting like store managers in place who are like 21 years old uh, mm -hmm. running those stores. You know, those 21 year olds are going to have a lot of energy. They're going to do a lot of good things. They might be really, really talented, but are they going to be really good at running a store and managing people and creating a work environment where people are excited to be working there? Uh, and sp and speak the language, speaking the language of the new age customer too. That might be going, that might be coming through the door. Uh, at the same time, I think this is one of those. Uh, this is not the executive quicksand talk, but we do have a have a talk uh, around this idea of quicksand, and this kind of reminds me of that. 
at the same time where some people are just kind of dug in going, dadgummit, I just wanted to go back to the way it was, or I'm just going to hold on until it gets back to the way it was, or this isn't what I signed up for whenever I signed on to be a manager. Uh, you know, every, everybody's kind of grasping at those uh, those same straws right now, trying to figure stuff out. But I think the, the ones who are asking the next question, like, what do we need to do to be able to be ahead of the next thing? Um, I think those are the ones who are, 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 are probably going to thrive in this, you know, environment now. And it's not, you know, Don, all bleak there are people who have like we've said have figured this idea out um they they recognize that the talent shortage or uh, potentially that there's a shortage of people uh but but there's also organizations that are hoarding talent right now too and just and just they're they're in growth mode like we're gonna grab talent whenever we can but there's reason those talented people want to go work there at the same time it's because they're speaking the language of the people uh you know the potential prospects that they're trying to hire um as well yeah, and the only way you can hoard talent is you have to be a great place to work. Otherwise, right. that talent that you're hoarding is going to come in, and then they're going to go right out the back door. They're, you're going to lose those. And I, I might, you know, and that might be that might be something where what you just said right there is probably where a lot of people are. Like, well, dadgummit, every time we try to hire somebody, uh, you know, they ghost us. Every time we try to hire somebody, we'll make an offer and they always, you know, they they, they always, uh, you know, come back with something else. They're never satisfied. Every time we try to hire somebody, maybe they're here for like a week, uh, 30 days. Like we're just constantly hiring, but you're not asking the next obvious question of, of uh, you know, why why are people choosing to leave? It's it's the first step to be able to be a place where people want to come to apply. It's a, it's another part of the equation where people want to come and stay and help you thrive as an organization. That's a whole other part to it too, right? I don't want to just create a, a group of workers that are coming in with their head down and just working. Like I, I want a group of workers that are trying to help me push this thing over the goal line because they're, we're all fighting for the same thing. And man, that doesn't just happen. You've got to, you've got to kind of breed that mentality over and over again, uh, just being really, really clear about what it is that you're trying to do as far as this game you're, you're looking to win. Yeah. And, and uh, I'll be real here. It looks different depending on where you're sitting right now. Like the situation looks different. If you're sitting there going like the quality of applicants that we're getting is really, really poor, then you might be blaming the applicants for this. But what I, what we point out is that what you're missing is the invisible applicants and invisible applicants are people who would think about applying for a job, but applicants are more adept at ever at learning what it's like to work for your company. And so they're looking at your company and they're learning from your company. And if your current employees are not very happy and they're hearing that, you're missing applicants. You're missing a lot of the best applicants for the job. Uh, so a yeah. lot of it's not, you. if you're writing off the whole generation saying they're lazy, it's probably something you're doing. And you know, a, a couple of things that I would ask you to kind of add to this, Don, because I know, you know, you and I, you and I travel a lot together. We speak, we speak quite a bit too, but uh, I like how you just said maybe something that you're doing or something that you're speaking into existence, so to speak, right? One of the things that you like to say is if, if I, if I'm under the mentality that millennials are lazy or Gen Z is lazy and, and they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're lazy workers. They're always late, blah, blah, whatever that is, whatever that story is that I've assigned to them, then that's, that's going to come across and how I treat them. And if that comes across and how I treat them, it's going to come across and how they respond to me. Um, at the, there's a natural rub, um, already. And so, uh, maybe you're, you're, accidentally involuntarily speaking some of those things into existence based off of what you thought you knew uh, instead of taking a look around um, and recognizing the people that I have in front of me might, might actually be, cap be capable of more. Yeah. If you manage your millennials and your Gen Z's like they're lazy, then they're more likely to be lazy. Right. Uh, and, and frustrated and then leave and then go to another employer. And you're going to say good riddance because you were lazy anyway, and you were dumb. And this whole generation is bad. Meanwhile, the other employer who doesn't treat them like that and gives them responsibilities and sets metrics and goals for them and develops them and works with them, then they suddenly become rock stars and they were rock stars all along. Hey, can't we say this the reverse way too? If I'm a millennial or a Gen Z that's been promoted to a managerial position and I'm looking at the Gen Xs or maybe the baby boomers that are still hanging on and I think they can't handle change, I think they're slow to create change, I think they're curmudgeons, uh, you know, I think they're, you know, Debbie Downer, or whatever that might be, like this is true both ways, right? Yeah, yeah, you'd be a fool to say I'm not going to capitalize on that experience and that wisdom of the other people around us. Uh, sometimes when we describe stories of companies being very people centric, we get the question of like, well, where do you find people like that? And our answer is always the same. You've already got them. They probably already work for you. They're just people. We're just describing people. We're not describing unusual people. 
we're describing people who are aligned and empowered and in the right spot. And this perfect storm is creating a situation where we used to kind of get away with not being people centric. And now you're not going to be able to get away with it anymore. Uh, organizations are not going to be able to keep being organizations if you can't find people. Uh, and if you can't nurture that talent and you're going to lose expertise and you're going to not be able to do the things you need to do. Um, so I know, I know this is a big topic. I'm sure we're going to keep circling back around this one because it's a major, major trend that's out there for people. But I think what we want to do is kind of leave some quick tips here. And I like Matt, what you said about like training up people, like we really need to be deliberate about not just training frontline managers, but also like executives, what exec, what skill sets do executives need, uh, that they're going to need to have to be taken on executive positions. How do I design my company, my organization? How do I think strategically those kinds, how do I delegate those kinds of skill sets that are a little bit more advanced? I think are going to be really important. Um, and then also the idea of just working towards becoming a really great employer, like just thinking about that piece of it, uh, I think is also really important because you're going to have to win this battle for labor with other people. Um, what would you add at Matt? I think I think part of that is is the mentality, right? So part of that is is recognizing that you know as an employee, it used to be, man, I'm so fortunate to have this job. Uh, but I would encourage humility with leadership right now to recognize if you are fully staffed or if you feel like you have kind of figured that out, make sure your folks know it, right? Make sure your folks know it because they, they if, if if the bear is in the woods, uh, there are other employers that are trying to seek out the people that you are holding near and dear right now. Um, and so don't, don't get to that place to where you're comfortable with it. Right. It's, it, it's, it's a blessing to be able to work there, but man, as a, as a, as a leader of an organization, man, I'm blessed to be able to be surrounded by people who are on the same mission that I am. And I want to make sure they don't forget that. Um, I think that works both ways and maybe a mentality that, um, hasn't always been there for, for a lot of organizations. If you think of the movie Forrest Gump, I always think the Bubba Gump shrimp company started with the hurricane, right? And it's because he set the ship sail and rode it out and was delivered about it. And then he came back to port and all the others that stayed in port, all those other ships got destroyed. I think that's the opportunity out there. Those of you who invest in your people and your managers and get better at this process than you've ever been before, get weirdly good at it. Uh, you're going to come away and you're going to be the last person standing and you're going to find yourself in a great position. So that's what we want to leave you with. It's not all gloom and doom in terms of this perfect storm. There's opportunities out there for you. It is no longer being people centric is no longer a soft thing. That's just out there. It's something that you're going to have to do to really survive in the market. But the good news is that surviving is going to mean thriving here as we move forward. So thanks a lot for joining us on the people centric podcast. Uh, we're going to be talking more about this topic soon. If you got any suggestions, shoot them out to us. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, thanks for joining us on the people centric podcast. Thank you for listening to the People Centered Podcast. We are so grateful for you joining us every week. If you like this content, please like and subscribe. Also, feel free to share on your social media with everyone that you know. It really does help us. If you would like to contact us, I have put our information in the show notes. Please reach out anytime. We love hearing from you. We will be back next week with a new topic. Until then... Be well and lead well.